Hello and thank you for watching this presentation by the American Iron Society. Please support the organization by becoming a member. Go to irises.org and click on join. Thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce Anna Cad, tonight's speaker. Um, and uh, just to start out, to uh, give you a little background about Anna, she was born and raised in Olesnica in Poland. I'm not sure if I said that right. Perfect, Anna. perfect. Um, Anna went into botany and uh, holds a master's in biology and a PhD in plant ecology. She did a stint in plant breeding in Poland where she was crossing wheat and rye and was the author of several introduced lines and varieties of triticale. She came to the U.S. to visit her aunt and uncle in Santa Rosa, and after a while, she married David Cadd, and they settled in Healdsburg, California. Um, Anna and David then managed a, a big home garden and commercial Cadd's Beehive Iris Garden, and they introduced more than 100 iris varieties, about 70 bearded, and more than 30 beardless irises, including 33 spuria irises. Uh, they received 11 uh, Award of Merits, 31 Honorable Mentions, the William Moore Medal, the John Wister Medal, and three Eric Nees Medals for Spurry irises, and many other awards from around the world. Anna is also a master judge in AIS, and after David passed away in 2015, Anna is now the sole proprietor of Cad's Beehive Iris grow Garden, growing well over 1,500 iris varieties. And Anna is currently the vice president of the Spuria Iris Society. So please welcome Anna Cad. Hello, everybody. Welcome from Hillsburg, California. Today we have only 85 degrees, but for the whole week was 95 in the shade on my back porch. So it is hard to actually garden in the conditions like this. A I am the vice president on the, of Santa Rosa Iris Society. And uh, I'm trying to do as much as I can with all the uh, society functions. A title of this presentation is Spuria Irises for Every Garden, a little history and a lot of beauty. Because those Spurias are with us, they are in our gardens and that is me. When you see them blooming the first time, the health stops. I remember when the first time I come to David Place in May and the spurias were blooming, not very many. I just fall in love from the moment when I saw this, saw them. They are not grow, they were not growing in Poland in this time. So I will present the spurlia for every garden. Little history and a lot of beauty. How you cannot love them? when they are so beautiful. Now I need to explain this beautiful drawing because it's hard to make the presentation for people who, are, who never saw the spurlia. He never grew the spurlias. He never even heard about spurlias. And you tell, oh, I grow spurlia irises. And they are telling, hmm, what that? And then there are people who are growing with spurias from the baby. The parents, grandparents were growing them. They knew everything and they know everything about spurias. They are hybridizers, they, they are award winners. And how hard is to make the presentation for everybody. So everybody will try to maybe, maybe learn something and present something. So why this presentation maybe will be easy for some people and some for some, maybe just something new. So how I invoke the interest about Spuria? Okay, let's see. The every, almost every picture on this presentation is signed, but that is only for the educational purposes and to know what this may be if someone is interested. And if I use someone, someone's else picture, which is probably not more than 10 of them, I put the credit who made this picture. All the pictures are mine pictures. So let's see what the Wiki Encyclopedia is talking about spurias. Spurias are tall, from two to feet, eight to five feet tall, 
and they are elegant and have the very attractive foliage. The shape of the bloom often suggests orchids and the color range from white and yellow, blue, vine, brown and black. And most often they have the bright yellow signals. This particular class is equivalent to the botanical series Spuria. The highest award for Spuria is Eric Nies Medal. Oh, that was the science description. But the best description is when the visitors are coming to my garden and they stay on the gate and, oh my God, isn't that wonderful? That's, I heard more about spurias that I heard about tall birded and different birded varieties. So let me tell you about some spuria irises. They just happened in the old world, long, long time after the earth was created. And they happened here in this yellow land from the Portugal and Gibraltar to the Kamchatka and the Japan islands. They happened after the last ice age. The last ice age, the last glacial period started 110,000 years ago and ended about 12,500 12, years ago. And this white stuff that's all was covered by glacial. So as you can see, they come after the ice area. And maybe also they happen because of this man. This man is Charles Darwin. He is the colleague of the father of evolution and natural selection. Or maybe this everything started because of this man, Karol Linneusz, like we say in Poland, or Karol Linnea, or whatever you pronounce. Probably every country has a different presentation of uh, pre, um, pronunciation of his name. This man collected almost all known plants in Europe in the time when he was living, and the, he's the father of the systematics. So that's what the evolution is going. Sometimes it's going on the right, and sometimes it's going to the left. But doesn't matter if you believe on evolution of species, species or not, spurias appeared. And they started from Spain and Western Mediterranean area. And they went to the, they are in the Danish island and small colony is in England, in Corsica, Europe, Russia, Afghanistan, into, into China. And we are talking about species. Those are those plants which nature created or maybe the God created or maybe who knows. Anyway, those are species. And they are very diversified because they are growing from the different condition. They grow in the salty marsh and they grow in the desert and sands. And so there's a lot of diversified, diversified and they are different. So people studied to, started to study them. They were here, they started to look at them. In the Renaissance, Linnaeus was able to collect some and classify some of those spurias. And people started to notice them. There was no cell phones, so they were making the drawings and they were beautiful drawings and still can be really seen in the Louvre Museum. And then look how beautiful are those drawings. There was the different flowers and all drawings, just beautiful. Here on this different types of irises, there is the spuria here. It's not signed. It's not signed in this description, but that's spuria. At least look like spuria to me. And sometimes they were making the mistake on this beautiful drawing from 1912. The signage here is iris spuria. But this looks to me like Siberian iris. But maybe I am wrong. One of the first spurias introduced, which was actually hybrid already, was the monspur. 
It was introduced in 1980, no, in 1895. And this monster, we need to remember this name, come from the combination of two species which produce this hybrid. That was Iris monieri and Iris spuria. So it's mon spur monieri spuria. But this iris has 22 chromosomes. And so it couldn't come actually from Monieri and Spuria. We suspect now that this iris come from Iris halophila and Iris maritima. So this Monieri, uh, this Monieri is the yellow iris. Uh, that's what Foster uh, around that Monieri from Turkey and Iris Spuria, Iris then no Iris uh, Ocloleuca, now called Iris Orientalis, that they were parents of this. But we know now that this is different, different thing. This Monieri actually is the cross which was found, uh, which was actually uh, found in the one of the garden in France and nobody knew how it's disappeared, how it's appeared actually in this garden. And no one never found this iris in the wild. We suspect that this is cross between iris turkey yellow and iris orientalis. Turkey yellow was shipped to French garden, one of the French gardens by French soldiers, the seeds. And we don't know actually exactly what the species is, but this species has 40 chromosomes. So probably this monspur is crossed between Iris halophila and Iris maritima. So spurias belongs to two groups. One group that are species and another group that are hybrids. Species is we now uh, believe that is between 16 to 20 different species and they are distributed from Spain to China. They grow everywhere. They grow in desert and salty water, in the alkaline condition, in salty and even acid conditions. And the second group, the hybrids, those which are now growing in our gardens. I think that out of the 60 to 20 different species, half of them are not in the existence anymore. It's very hard to find them. The expeditions like going to Afghanistan to look for them is impossible to do. And they may be completely extinct and maybe gone forever, but maybe they are still around. But hybrids, those are those irises which we have in our garden. So that is the, in the Brian Matthew from British Irish Society, put the spurias to the section spuria in the genus Iris. But it was so many of those different species and they were like from very tiny to the very huge that Rodionienko, which was the Russian botanist, Russian soldier, he divided them into group the larger species and the smaller species, easy enough. <laughs> Those which are below 36 inches, they are smaller. Those are from 36 to 64, they are larger. We still divide them like this because that's handy and easy to see. So those are those larger species and those are those smaller, supposed to be 16 to 20, but maybe some of them not exist. Maybe some of them are the same with two different names. It will be hard to dis di discover. And actually this whole knowledge about species is very difficult and hard to pronounce. So that is the, that is the Iris orientalis, one of those big species name Ocroleuca and Orientalis. And those are, well, in my garden, they can be four to five feet tall. And that is another very known species, uh, cross two species, which is already hybrid, cross Iris maritima and Iris catalinia. And what is interesting, maritima come from the Northern Africa, catalinia come from the 
Turkey, Afghanistan, and Iran, actually, Iran and Iraq. And they are both tall species. But Iris Belize, who probably everybody knows, they are not growing very tall. They are like four feet tall the most. And another small example of the small spurias, that's Iris graminia, very often found in our gardens. Beautiful little drink and smells like violets, except I never smell because I cannot go so low to, see, to smell them. So how we got the modern spurlia hybrids? So there we had those species, 16 to 20 species, and they cross themselves. They cross themselves and they give hybrids. Or some species cross with the hybrids and get more hybrids. Or hybridizers cross species together and get hybrids or hybridize across species with hybrids and get more hybrids, or they just cross hybrids. And now 90% of spurlia, 95% of spurlias in our garden, those are hybrids growing in our gardens. How it started? Michael Foster started in 19, 1985, crossed those two species, Monspur, and then one of the big name, Eric Nies, he was living in California and he use, was using Monspur to create all the important spurlias in today irises. After he died, Mar Marion Walker took his seedlings and he introduced very, very many of them. And Carl Milliken, also in California, introduced one of the uh, very important spurlias, Badi Zem Zem, this Spurlia received first Eric Nies Award. It was first award, now is the medal. But this is Zem Zem brought the different colors in Irish Spurlia and also brought very interesting, uh, important thing, resistant to virus. Irish species and most, some of the hybrids are susceptible to virus, but if they have body Zem Zem, in the pedigree, they will be resistant to virus. Ben Hager and several different hybridizers, but total, it's about only 100 hybridizers in 100 years of American Irish society. Some of them introduce one or two spuria, some of them introduce a lot, but only about 100 hybridizers. Imagine how many hybridizers we have in total banded alone. So how the hybrids start in cultivation? Of course, they start from seeds. The seeds can be very light and yellow, or they can be very dark. Dave Nassforger suspects that the light seeds are giving the light colored spurias, and the dark seeds are giving the dark colored spurias still need to be checked if this is true. So the seeds we are growing in the seed pods. And then with, when we plant them, they grew into the seedlings. Usually the fresh seeds are the best to, the best to germinate, but they germinate and they grow into the one, old, one year old seedlings, which they need to survive the winter. And then after two years, they are nice looking plants. And hurrah, they bloom on the second year, if we are lucky. Usually then they bloom on the third year. And now I wanted to stress something very important. Every section in judge handbook has this scale of points. That is not that we are going with this piece of paper and point score every iris because we don't have time. We are busy, it's hot. We have hundreds of irises who will be point scoring every iris. But I recommend that everybody will take 10 sheets and point score 10 different plants. And that will put in the brain the information for what to look that first for the spurlia, we need to look for the clump effect. Then we need to look for the flower. Then we need to look for the plant. 
and then for the distinctiveness. If you scone 10 different clumps of spurlia, you will be to the end of your life coming to the garden and telling, oh, that is the good one. Oh, I don't like this one. I, we are not talking, I don't like, but I will not recommend this one to grow in my garden. And look at this color here is 15 points in tall banded is only five. But let's go to this clump effect. Clump effect. Clump need to be very nice organized because on the spurlia, we are looking from the distance, from the distance from the across the garden, because those are big plants. They are sometimes five feet tall. So we don't, we don't plant them on the driveway next to the house. We plant them far away. And then when they are far away, then we look at them from the distance. And so they need to be nice, nice organized. Flowers need to be above the leaves so we can see them. And the clumps need to be nice and clean and flowers need to be very nice dispersed on the stacks because we look at them from the distance, five, 10 feet away. And those are beautiful stacks on the beautiful clumps. Look how beautiful is this clump, how nice organized. We can see those flowers from the distance. And there are some more examples of the nice looking clumps. Clump effect 15 points. So it is a lot really. And beautiful looking clump just make your heart stop. There are some pictures from the last year in my garden. And a little more. Come on. Okay, so we know. We are looking from the distance. We need to see the good looking clump because even if the spurlia will die, die in summer, go dormant, we we'll still see them for at least seven to eight months. So they need to look good in the garden. The next thing is the flower. Flower is taking 40 points out of 100. And I will tell about flowers more. So we will take, talk about color, substance and durability and form. And I will look first on the color. So the color, color can be bright or can be soft and muted. Color can be without the signal. It was the trend to bring the signal out. Now is the trend to bring the signal back. Flower can have small diffuse signal. That is the signal right here, not around the bird because those are birdless, they don't have birds. And the signal can be bigger. Look how big is this signal. And signal can be small also, but pronounced, distinctively pronounced, and can be also big and pronounced. Signal can be fancy. And I don't know how to describe fancy, it's just looking fancy, it's looking nice. And more about the color. So they can be cells. So this, let, let's see what kind of self colors we can see in spurias. Those are selves. The color can be slightly blend, like two different colors blend together. Slightly blend or distinctively, distinctively blend. They can have delicate hues. They can be bicolors. And this is definitely bicolor. Okay, that is missing one picture, sorry. Supposed to be yellow and uh, yellow and blue. They can be the plicata pattern. So they can be plicatas and color breaks. That is the color break right here, right here. And I will mention about this color break a little later. And they can have new pattern which, which may call blaze, but we don't know for sure yet how this will go. So now the colors of self, white, creamy white, yellow, creamy yellow, and yellow. They can be orange and yellow brown 
and blue. And blue is like sky. Every day is blue and every day is a little different blue. So different colors of blues and different shape of blues. They can be mauve and what color is that? Okay, lavender, missing lavender. I'm sorry, I hope that this is not the, okay. Violet purple, they can be violet purple and red purple and burgundy red. And they can be burgundy dark burgundy red. And bronze and very deep purple. No, oh, come on, come on. And then we have blacks. He is missing. So the second thing is the substance and durability. And sometimes this is hard to explain. So flower has the good substance when the petals are thick and then maintaining the, maintain the form of the flower for three to four days. Of course, we are talking in the real conditions, not 95 degree with the drought, two years drought, but three to four days, if they will maintain the good substance, they will not wilt. That's mean that they have good substance. And durability is the term which describe that spurnia flowers need to maintain good form for three to for three at least three days. So if spurnia has the good substance, it has the good durability because the flower will be open for at least three days. And here you can see the durability problems. This flower will not last for three days. And now the form of the flower. Because the spurias are only 15 to 20 generations from species, there is very different form of the flowers. Tall birds are about 100 generations from species. So the form is much more improved than form of the species. But in spurias, it's only 15 generation and mostly the tall spurria species from Turkey we use for the hybridizing. So there is a lot to improve yet with the rattling and lace and texture and everything else. So the standards can be nice, narrow and erect and they can be semi erect and they can be flat, laying flat. And all three positions of the standards are perfectly acceptable. The flowers can be rufflet, slightly rufflet or more rufflet. More ruffles is better. More ruffles, this is really nice looking. Then flowers can be small or they can be huge. They can have very wide standards and very wide falls. You can see how wide standards and falls those standards are sticking out from uh, above the clump and those forms, falls are displaying the color very nicely. Standards, very wide standards and falls. And they can have also have elongate, elongated standards and falls. But sometimes there are flap standards, like for example, this one flap, this one flap, and this one flap and this one is flapping and those I don't even know how to call this. So that is not acceptable. If they are all standing up or semi erect or flat, they are fine. But that they cannot be one standing and one flapping. That is big no no. There is one exception, the spuria named Sparking Cider, which has all three standards twisting in like like twisting around and they all doing this step. And was introduced sparking cider because it's like bubbling appearance. Now, if the star in the falls are tackle un under and go under, that is not good because from the distance, we cannot see the color of the falls. Also, in, if the standards are capping up, 
we cannot see the color of the standards from the distance. So that is big no-no. The, the hybrid is not supposed to be introduced if it's doing this. I need to point that some of those names are not, those plants may be not typical to the name. I just found the flower, which I wanted to show Capic up standards. I may love this variety and maybe only one flower was doing this, but that's what it is. So Anna, now we, yes. And I have a question, um, one question in the chat. Uh, what zones do Spuria grow in? Zone is, Spurias will grow almost everywhere. They can grow from Canada. They grow very well in Canada. They grow in the whole United States. And uh, they started to grow now in Europe and the Milan Blazek and several Serbian hybridizer has now a lot of spurias, beautiful. They grow all over the Europe. They will actually grow everywhere because they have this spuria behind them, which I adapted to different soil conditions. So they will be growing in every zone, except maybe extreme situation like Hawaii they may not grow in Hawaii. It's just too wet and too hot. And... But if you wanted to start growing spurlia, just try. I am sure that you will be not disappointed. Thank you. Okay, now I would like to tell about something which is a little confusing. What is stellar arm and what is the club? Is close your eyes for a second, imagine tall bearded flower. And we know what is stallion in, in tall bearded and what are the halves, half markings. This same thing is also in spurias. They have stallions and they have the markings on the stallions. But in the judge handbook is the strange word club. What is this club? It's mentioned only once and it's on page 200 and it's not explained. So I would like to explain what this actually is, this club, which they are talking, what they are talking in the, in the book. So how the spurlia flower look like? Standards, everything in tree, because spurlia, uh, uh, irises have everything in tree. So three standards, three falls, one, two, and three. Then there is the stale arm, and on the end of stallion is style crest, and inside are antlers, which are not visible on this picture. So now, look at this. Fall in Spuria is like divided by two sections. One section is big and wild, and the second is the narrow, very narrow. This narrow part of the fall attach the fall to the parent tube, which is right here. So this part of the fall is like two parts, wild part and narrow part. On this narrow part, there are hafts. They are like hafts on tall bird. If you look open the flower, you can see those tiny markings. On the top of those narrow part is laying sty arm and sty crest. And all this thing which I put inside the frame is the cloud. Cloud is the part of the fall in Spuria, which connects the wild part of the fall to the perian tube with the style arm and style crest. And this style crest can be very tight laying on this narrow part of the fall or can be separated or can be very much separated. It's better when it's like laying low because if it's too separated, it's just too wild looking flower. So this is the same. Clav is doing the same role, connecting the fall to the perian tube. And this clav has hafts, like in embedded irises, and this is the elongated part of fall and the style arm was the style crest laying on the top of fall. 
So one more time, the clock in Spurlias is the part of the pole which display the white part of the pole away from the pendant tube plus hat plus tire arms with tire crest. Okay, I went to the hard part. One more time to look at this. Okay, that's what it is. So if we have the short clasps, as you can see, the flowers are very nice and compact. They look very elegant and compact. But if they are very long, they spreading the fall far away of the center of the flower. And then the flower looks sort of unorganized. Also with a lot of flowers in the clump, they start to interfere with each other. So it's better to have short or just semi-short clump. And those are those anthers which I mentioned before. Uh, they open, if you wanted to cross and hybridize, you will need to probably open the spurlia flower and remove those anthers because they open quite early and they can self-pollinate the flower. So it's good to remove the anthers, remove the falls so the bees cannot land on the flower and then leave this for two days and then we bring the pollen from different spurlia and put the pollen on the stigmatic leaves and you will get the good cross. So fall. A very desirable form, short clubs, compact flowers, nice wrapping. Beautiful display of colors. And look how beautiful the spurlia display the color of the fall. And sometimes happens that the falls are pinching. The same in tall bird that if they are pinching, that is very bad, bad, bad thing because they cannot show the color of the fall from the distance, like we are evaluating the clump from the distance, we sometimes we can get away with some of those pinching flowers, but it's better not to have them. So spurlias looking good from every side. Okay. Oh no, it's missing. I wanted to show no, don't tell me that this is not going to go anymore. Okay, anyway, I wanted to have do two beautiful pictures of this very, very close up. Maybe I can go previous and see if that's will maybe go. I am sorry for this. No, it's not going to work. Previous. No, it's not going to work. I'm sorry. You know, I don't know what's happened. I have the close up on one, like one sixteen of the fall to show how the beautiful they are from the close. But anyway, everybody can go and look in their own garden. And insects love the spurlia flowers. There is always some ants because spurlias, they produce a lot of nectar that is coming from Iris Orientalis. And when they are, when is the nectar, then is their ants. And if they are ants, then they are aphids or vice versa. And if you put the spurlia on the show bench, be very careful because right here, there will be colonies of uh, aphids. And in the nice hot room, they will come, come out and they will get your blue ribbon away. Okay, so good stuff is always on demand. So now let's very, very quick talk about the plant. Plant is 35 pounds, very, very lot also. So stacks and foliage, those are one or two years old clumps, stacks. This is how the spurlias look at spring when there are no flowers yet. There are only the leaves and they look good. They look really good in the garden, especially on the borders, on the, on the borders of your garden. And months after covered by flowers. And if, they are, if the stacks are bringing the flowers up to the top above the leaves, that is very good. Oh, for crying out loud. The perfect spurlia stacks. Stacks need to be straight. They need to bring the flower up to show the flower above the leaves. Because like we are talking about the clump, 
we need to see them from the distance. So some of the flowers may be imperfect, but in the good clump, when the old stacks are bringing everything up, they look very nice. Leaves, leaves need to, our oh, well, leaves we will be talking. It needs to be nice ratio, stems to leaves. Usually two to three stems per rhizome, but uh, that's lucky if you get, but even one per rhizome plus increases in the good clump will also looking good and will bring the next year really nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yes. Now. yes, Andy? Foliage. Foliage, it means leaves. Leaves need to be standing up because if they are not standing up, they are not looking good in the garden. Need to be graceful. They can be straight or they can curve, but gracefully curve. And here was one beautiful picture with the straight and that picture with the leaves, which are not good. This spurlia cannot be introduced because with the leaf like this in the garden, this doesn't even look like spurlia. Oh, for crying out loud. Floriferousness. Oh, I, I managed to say this word. I speak with the Polish accent, so excuse me if you cannot understand everything which I am talking about. Floriferousness means how many flowers is on one stack? Supposed to be two to three branches and six to seven flowers per stack. But that is in the good condition, like in California, they will have eight flowers eight or even more. Lee Walker is telling that he has spurias with 16 flowers on the stems, but I never saw them and I am having some doubts, but maybe he has. So seven flowers per stem is fine. They need to open in sequence, not all everything in once because then it's very big mess. And then we will see the stack blooming only for three, four or five days. So in sequence, it is very good in the open and the bloom stacks can last for two weeks in the good condition with the nice weather. I actually have had stacks in the base on the front porch for three weeks. Uh, of course, the last flowers, we are not so perfect, but three weeks stack. So why is Puglia are so, are so valuable in the floral industry? Because they are big. They can make the huge arrangement out of, out of them for the windows or funerals, and they last for two weeks in the arrangement, which is better than nothing. And then distinctiveness. Distinctiveness is that something which has the character, which has some kind of personality. We can introduce 25 orange or yellow spurias, and they look the same, and we will not know which one is which one. But if they have something, maybe more ruffle, ruffles, maybe the uh, crinklet, or maybe the huge flowers, they have this distinctiveness which can easily recognize them even without the label. Like for example, a speeding star, you would recognize in every garden because it's so distinctive. And like, Midnight Rival, this spurlia is so beautiful and so, so distinctive. You will see this once and in every garden you will ask, oh, is this the one, Midnight Rival? Orientalis, which is still spurlia growing everywhere. Everywhere in all, it's like, it was the house 100 years ago. The house is gone, only chimney left, but there is the clump of Orientalis next to this chimney, still blooming. Okay, and this is now another problem. That is the picture of Spuria in May. And that was the picture of Spuria in September when all those leaves died. And I, I apologize, that is my laptop is not loading those pictures. And that is another one example supposed to be. Okay. So I, I, I cut the spurias in September. I cut them about uh, half a feet tall because when I wanted to ship the spurias, I wanted to have some piece left of the rhizome to write on them. 
So when I cut them, they look nice. You know, the garden is not nothing is there except cut spurias, but they look good. I wanted to show you something very interesting. Spurias growing from the bloom stacks. It happens on some years more often than on another. And that is the leftover of the bloom stack. And this is the new plant of spurlia growing. And you can see how nice they grow. And those are those plants growing on the old bloom stacks. If you plant, if you cut this here and plant this plant in the ground, like you will plant regular spurlia, it will put the roots and give you the nice clump next year. Look how strange this is. And they don't know what's happened, why that is better. But this type of reproduction is happens. Some years I don't see them at all. And sometimes I see on this year, I saw several of them. And now there was the nice picture of the great spurlia rhizomes and they are not here. So, okay. I'm sorry that I lost all those nice pictures of rhizomes, which I wanted to show. So anyway, that is the mother rhizome. It bloom, has the bloom stuck, and put two increases. That is one increase and another increase. Those two will bloom next year. There is three, two, three more increases on this side and two on this side. They will bloom in two years. They may be even more right here. So they will be blooming later. And then, oh, for crying out loud, I'm sorry. So the rhizomes we wrap, we cannot ship them dry because they will never make. We dig spurias in September, October, or November in California as late as possible. And every spuria is diapered in the two layers of paper towel, put into the wet, the paper towel is wet and put in the Ziploc bag, bag and then we are signing the Ziploc bag, bag and also the leaves. And uh, are the spurlias in favor? Like, do I'm shipping a lot of spurlias? Not really, because spurlias are not as popular as they're, sup they're supposed to be. And maybe this program will change this. And Oh, come on, and I cannot go. Okay, and I lost three or four really nice pictures about the how to use the spurias in the PowerPoint presentation. What I think is you just saw about 300 pictures or maybe 280 pictures. And I think that there is too many pixels in those pictures. And unfortunately, the computer cannot handle this amount of data. And that's probably what happened. But maybe and they will be nice enough to put this presentation on YouTube. And maybe then if someone would like to see the missing pictures, we can see them. And, and maybe that's that would be the way to just go again and see how those pictures look like. They were missing pictures of the dead spurias in September and the fresh, fresh dig spuria rhizomes. That is us. That's all our, that's and of course, our president, me vice president, and um, Daryl, which is the newsletter editor, and um, Debbie Jones and Cheryl Dita. And let's see. And there was the picture of the bulletin, bulletin of the Spurlia Iris Society, which was this picture right here. Of course, they didn't show. And Daryl is doing excellent job presenting those bulletins twice, twice a year. So for mere $12 a year or 30 bucks for three years, you can get twice a year bulletin like this, beautiful bulletin and a lot of information. You can also access to the uh, pictures on the website. And the website is Spurlia Iris Society. Maybe I didn't lose. OK, so are you upset? Buy plants. Are you happy? Buy plants.
just get paid by plants, stress by plants, bore by plants, need milk by plants, it's your best day, by all the plants. And that was here the picture of spuria because that's what we are going to buy, the spuria plants. Thank you for your patience. And I hope that you learned a little about spurias. Anna, I have a, a couple questions, or one question anyway. Yes. Um, how often should spuria clumps be dug and separated? Okay, when you get your spuria rhizomes, plant them as far apart, apart as you can manage in your garden. Our gardens are small, but minimum for spurias is three feet apart. So if you get the breezy day and speeding star, plant them three feet apart because they will grow. In five to six years, they can be three feet in every direction, huge clumps, and they will blend together, they will go together. So you don't need to dig spurias in 10 years, preferably seven years will be the best thing to dig them because then they will be growing one clump into each other. But imagine in three or four years, three to four feet wild clump in every direction. And you don't need to dig them. Unfortunately, I lost those pictures of the spurias which, have the, which die in the clump. But maybe we will see this later on YouTube. Anyway, spurria, I have the spurria growing 20 years in this same location. And they are still blooming and they are fine. So give them room. If you give them enough room to grow, you don't need to dig them because digging spuria is, is nothing like digging tall birded. You need to have the backhoe and two good friends with the strong arms because they have wire roots and they can go. It's very hard to dig them out. You need to leave them with the fork and pry them out from the ground. And that is very, very heavy work. So if I don't need to dig them, I don't dig them. I just leave them to grow and make the beautiful clumps. Oh, and, uh, Gary, give me a second. I wanted to, uh, I'm sorry to put somebody on the spot, but Nancy Niece is here. And uh, Nancy um, is the granddaughter of Eric Niece. Oh no, that. Yeah, and you all where, know. Where she and, is, where she so, is, Nancy, show yourself. Nancy, yeah, you wanna say hello? <laughs> where is Nancy? If you Nancy? want to, you don't have to, you have to unmute yourself first. Okay. If you want to unmute yourself, Nancy, and. Um... Now, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, we yes. can hear you, but yeah. I can still not, cannot find you on the screen. Where is Nancy? You have to, you have to make sure you're on speaker view. Uh, everybody, oh, the if you go to the top, there okay. is speaker view or gallery view. If you okay. speaker view, you can see the speaker. Okay, so, Nancy, so now uh, Nancy need to talk. So Nancy uh, lives not oh. far from LA in Bakersfield. Are you still in Bakersfield, Nancy? Yes, yes. And uh, we had a Spuria convention a few years back and she came and talked about her family and... Uh, Anyway, you want to say something, Nancy? You're welcome to. Well, I enjoyed your presentation, Anna. Thank you very much. And I have a lot to learn still, though I did learn a lot when I uh, put together the Eric Niece Chronicle, which uh, I think is still available. Thanks yes, yes, it is. Yes. Um, and uh, so I enjoyed meeting some of you a few years ago at the mini convention in Los Angeles. And um, so uh, I haven't done much with AIS, but I saw this presentation and I thought that's one for me. So <laughs> here I am. <laughs> and Nancy, when she gave us a presentation uh, back then, she talked about uh, Eric Nies and um, the family and uh, uh, spending time in, with the irises. And you're still collecting his irises, Nancy? Uh, well, I haven't been doing that. Actually, um, I only have one actual niece iris. Uh, let's see. 
and I can show you over here. I don't know if you can see this. Okay, which one that, is that? That is uh, a Pacific Coast native virus called orchid sprite. Okay. And that's the only one that I have. Um, and, and Eric Nies uh, introduced Pacific Coast. Uh, he introduced tall bearded, I believe, and he introduced spuria irises. So he introduced all kinds of different irises. Uh, but we know him uh, for the award that we give you for spuria irises. So it's a pleasure to have Nancy here. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Nancy, for coming. It is just the honor that you come and, 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 and oh, we can see you. It's a pleasure for me to, uh, to hear my grandfather's name mentioned uh, so long after he died. And uh, I think he would be very pleased to know that spurias have come a long way since uh, he first did his hybrids. And uh, the, what I was trying to show you here are two of his um, hybrids. The one on the, let's see if you can see Spuria hybrids. Let me, just a minute. Now, let's see, can you see two? Yes. Okay. The lower one is called Morgenstrahl, I think it is. In Dutch, it means um, uh, morning sunbeam. And the other one is uh, called Azure Dawn. And those were two of his actual hybrids. Uh, photos that he that he uh, took or had taken uh, of his hybrids in the 1940s. So it is so nice to meet you today. You know, it's like it's like you are part of our Iris family. <laughs> Thank you. Don't you. know a lot of spurias. You are just our family. Well, thank you. I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy.